Warning. This documentary contains material about sexual and gender-based violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Over 50% of women in South Africa have experienced gender-based violence. Throughout this documentary, we'll be hearing some of these stories. He coerced me into having sex with him, but I kept refusing. But he didn't care. For the longest time, I convinced myself that he didn't rape me until I told a friend and explained how I was raped. This happened six years ago. The Makana Rape Survival Support Group was founded in 2002. It is a gender-based violence non-profit that aims to help victims. In those days, 2002, the general atmosphere was very negative toward victims of rape. Uh, more or less, they said it was your fault, and you know, so... And if it was domestic, that was even less likely to, to bring any sympathy. That, that's your problem. Uh, so there was a real need for people who cared uh, to meet with these victims and help them as far as they could uh, to feel that there was somebody who cared. I had sex with him so he would stop hurting me. When I told my sub warden, she said I can report it, but it's not sexual assault because I consented. And I must be careful because the police would just think that I regretted having rough sex the night before. I never reported it. So they provide support. But what is it like to go through the usual university and legal channels? How is it stressful for victims? The official process is that you make an appointment with myself and I meet you with sit down and then you tell me what has happened um, and I receive the case. I will then inform you of your options. Coming to my office doesn't automatically mean that you're gonna open a case. You can come to me for an information, information session to decide what you want to do, but I am not in the business of kind of forcing you to you know, open a case because you know your voice has to be heard um, it's important for me to kind of give you the information that you need so that you can make an informed decision. But what happens if you do open a case? Okay, when the person opens a case for rape, her statement or his statement is taken. Um, from there, they will go to a health uh, facility where uh, we take biological samples, a DNA, which is very, very important in, in our investigation, especially in sexual offences cases. We work with um, subs very closely. We have a very strong relationship with subs because we know that um, reporting a case can be very intimidating. Last month, I wanted to open a sexual harassment case. The female police officer who was assisting me said I can't be surprised if men can't keep their hands off me because kepakile. I was so defeated, we're on our own. So how can it be traumatizing to report? I was raped in my second year. I reported it to the police. The policeman asked me the same question over and over about if I was sure my rapist was wearing a blue shirt at Friars, the nightclub. I couldn't remember. I never ended up finishing reporting my case because the constant paperwork and questions was just as traumatizing as the rape. So off we went to the Bantu Stephen Biko building where Rhodes Counseling Centre is located to try and get some more information. The, the trauma might be that maybe the student feels already scared about, I'm going to report, I don't know um, if I have all the facts, I don't know if I know who to speak to. We spoke to Namwazi Klasela to find out what happens when a victim comes to them and how is it different than pursuing the previous channels alone. It is important for us to be here for the victims because they, they won't get a second victimization. 
from the police because they were always with them. Some of some police don't have patience, you know. So when we are here next to the victim, they won't get the chance to say, "Did you see the perpetrator?" or being harsh to the victim. So that is that is why we are always there for them. And in relationship here too with with all victim does not end at the hospital. It continues up until the court date, or continue outside the court date. The caregiver who has accompanied this person uh, to the hospital, if that was necessary, uh, then stays with that person uh, until they're seen by the relevant people at the hospital and are either admitted or sent home. Uh, the police come again to pick them up uh, and again, the caregiver will go with the victim to wherever they're going to go. If they have no suitable place to go, they can go to our safe house. The organization has caregivers who offer support to survivors. These are their stories. And then I was having a case, like a guy, that was my first case then. The guy is in prison at Vilek. So, the Friday night, he was being molested in the cells of his inmate. The thing is this, I was also in this situation, but when I was still a child, I think was, I was 11 or 12 years old, and I was also molested by like another guy at school. But he didn't, he didn't do it at school. He scared me outside in the bush, he just knocked me. And then I just get unconscious. The next story involves a child victim. The counselor was overcome with emotion and was unable to continue with the story. Okay, and at, um, at the hospital, they told us that um, the child is, is um, has syphilis. And as we all know, psychiatrists is um, sexually transmitted to me. The counsellors have dedicated themselves to help, but this sometimes results in their own mental well-being suffering, and sometimes their wages. Um, they're only earning 1,600 rand a month. And you can understand that doesn't go very far in this day and age.